A warm welcome to the School of Politics at the University of Leeds. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all join us today for our um, first of our annual lectures on the politics of global challenges. So in our audience today, we're joined by scholars from all across the world who work on global health and work on gender and security from diverse disciplines, and also from policymakers and practitioners, including from the WHO. We also have our colleagues here at the University of Leeds and our students. Now, please be advised that we are recording this talk today um, and we will be sharing it on our Centre for Global Development website. So I'm Dr. Emma Louise Anderson. I'm co-director for the Centre for Global Development. And today our Centre for Global Development and our Centre for Global Security Challenges are coming together to launch this annual lecture. And we've got a, a, a wonderful talk from two leading um, experts on global health and gender, and who have published these really important insights into the gendered nature of COVID. So from joining us from Australia, we've got Sarah Davis, Professor Sarah Davis, um, from the School of Government and International Relations at Griffith University. Professor Davis's work is foundational to our understanding of global health governance, health security, and the women, peace and security agenda. So it's a real pleasure to have her here. Um, many of you will know that she's author of Containing Contagion, which came out last year, incredibly well-timed. Um, also a decade ago, The Global Politics of Health, which could never be more relevant than it is right now. She's also co-author of the Oxford Handbook of Women, Peace and Security and Disease Diplomacy. And she's joined um, by Dr. Claire Wenham, who's joining us today from the Department of Health Policy at the London School of Economics and Dr. Wenham works on global health security, global health governance, global disease control, and she's currently co-PI on two fascinating projects, analyzing women's risk of COVID and also the social economic effects produced by government responses. So some really interesting findings, hopefully. Oh. Um, just in terms of the order of things. So what we'll do is when the speakers have finished, I'll get you in the chat and then I'll invite them. somebody got their microphone. If you can make sure your microphones are on mute, that would be that would be great. Um, but yes, just in terms of the order of things, if you can put your questions in the chat and then I'll invite you to come and join us to actually voice your question where that's possible. If it's not possible for you to voice it, I will try and ask that question for Sarah and Claire myself. So Professor Davis and Dr. Wenham's talk today is entitled Gender Fail During Global Health Emergencies, Who Runs the World? And on behalf of both centres and the School of Politics and International Studies, I'm delighted to welcome you both. So over to you. Thank you so much, Emma, for such a generous introduction. That really was quite touching, actually. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who are interested, the backdrop of my screen is South Bank Parklands, which is at uh, one of our campuses of Griffith University, where we've got the Griffith Conservatorium of Music. And uh, I have a big wheel behind us, which yes, we did try and copy the London Eye. That was, that was deliberate, in case any of you are wondering. So I'm gonna be speaking for the first 15 minutes. And then after that, Claire's going to join me. One of the things that we'd like to add a caveat to before we begin is that this talk is amidst a pandemic and information changes frequently. And we certainly do welcome uh, the recent important changes that the World Health Organization has made to engaging with gender and health emergencies. And we hope to see that this engagement continues. Uh, for myself, just talking about my beautiful backdrop here, I'd like to acknowledge our country. Griffith University acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which I am sitting here tonight and I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend my respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and I recognise the land of the Turrbal and Jagera people on which I am here tonight. We would also like to acknowledge the loss of lives due to COVID-19 the recovery of survivors, the essential care and labour that is being provided around the world, and the economic, social, physical and mental harms that have occurred during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
So tonight we're going to be talking about a gender perspective concerning health emergencies. For us, one of the things that came out of the conversations that Claire and I have been having now for a number of years has been looking at the way in which health emergencies have gendered impacts. Uh, but these vulnerabilities and these impacts seem to be acknowledged as being harmful, but at the same time don't really get captured in the way that then the next health emergency is responded to. This year is the 20th anniversary of the Women, Peace and Security Resolution. It's the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform, which called for a gender perspective in all UN organizations and institutions. Surely this is the year where we could start to think about the degree to which a gender perspective has been incorporated, reflected upon, uh, has actual impact in terms of evaluation and implementation across states, as well as our United Nations institutions. And that was certainly the inspiration for this piece when we first started talking about it pre-COVID. Uh, for us, the World Health Organization, as Claire will be discussing, has this very clear mandate, the international health regulations, to coordinate and respond to health emergencies. And yet for us, what's striking about that instrument and striking about the efforts to implement it and the advice around its implementation from the World Health Organization has been a gender blindness. So in this paper, we're asking to what extent has the World Health Organization promoted and incorporated meaningful gender inclusion in health emergency response? And we think that's vital in the case of COVID-19, but we also think it's vital to look back as well and think about the consequence that, it, that its absence has had. And we argue that that is certainly the case when we look at the tragic reports that have been coming out, particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo, concerning the response to the Ebola outbreak uh, there in 2018 and 2019. So in the presentation tonight, I'm gonna to be talking you through the first two parts of the talk, and then Claire's gonna be talking you through the last, the, the third and the fourth. So in my section, I'm going to be looking at why is a gender blind response to health emergencies harmful? That seems like an obvious question to ask, and yet we think it's a really important one to, 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 to think about and to examine in terms of the role of the World Health Organization in this, in this theater. The second question is, the second part of the paper is, do we have a framework available to explain how to incorporate gender inclusion decision-making processes? Is one of the reasons that we're seeing this sort of reluctance here, can we explain it in terms of how we think about international organizations and their institutional framing? And what can be done then in response to that? The third part is that we look at then how the World Health Organization as is constituted at the moment in terms of being able to recognize gender within global health emergencies. What has been the practice up to recent and what is, has been happening in terms of the organization trying to think about and respond to uh, gender perspectives in health emergencies. And then finally, we look at whether or not COVID-19 is an opportunity for trying to promote progressive gender inclusion. I want to note briefly in the talk that the definition of gender is the characteristics of women, men, girls, and boys that are socially constructed. And this includes norms, behaviors, and roles associated with being a woman, man, girl, or boy, as well as the relationships with each other. And as a social construct, gender varies from society to society can change over time. I also acknowledge, however, that this working definition provided does not include non-binary genders. Um, and we certainly throughout our talk do refer to that. And we respect as well the need to have that more reflexive understanding as well of gender when we talk about it in terms of masculinities, femininities, but also non-gender binaries as well. Very briefly, um, the work that we did behind this presentation tonight. So we looked at the policy documents that the World Health Organization has published in the Gender Equality and Human Rights uh, Program. We looked at the health emergency programs and we looked at the international health regulations programs. And we looked at them for the period of time for which as long as we could find materials from those three programs. And we adopted what Lenny Hansen calls the methodology of reading where we looked at the context and the key words throughout these documents, looking at the advice and the guidance and the advocacy around particular terms around gender, women, gender women's specific health concerns, we looked at the states in terms of the advice that was issued to states, the actions that were advised for health actors in emergencies, the identification of, who's, of the World Health Organization's role in this, 
the core capacity strengthening advice that was being given to states and actors concerning the international health regulations. And we looked at the advisories that have been circulated around the construction of national health action plan, national action plans for health security. We also then extended our analysis to speeches by the former Dr. Margaret Chan, the current WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus. In addition to health emergencies and outbreaks, we looked at the advisories that have been issued in the statements for the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, as well as statements across a range of IHSR emergency committees from 2009 to, 2000 to 2020. We also looked at debates around global health emergencies and gender in the United Nations General Assembly, the Security Council, the media and the grey literature. What we were looking for here was conscious. It was looking for rep references to representation, inclusivity, reflexivity within the advice that was being issued on health emergency preparedness and response by the leading actor for setting the normative frameworks around global health governance and global health advisories, which is the World Health Organization. What we were looking for here was to see whose voices and experiences were absent, and can we start to explain maybe why these absences are occurring. Ignoring gender vulnerabilities and impacts of health emergencies, as I said before, is harmful. Women, men and non-binary genders experience epidemics differently. The variation of experience occurs across other sectors of society, including economic, racial, urban and rural divides. There are primary and secondary gendered impacts of epidemics. The primary effects will refer to the risk of infection and the health outcomes, which may be more acute depending on your gender. Your biological and social factors can also determine your risk of exposure, depending on the professions that you may be in, more likely to be in depending on your gender, the labor roles that you have during a crisis. And as we've seen in the case of COVID as well, your exposure as a healthcare worker. And again, thinking about the fact that worldwide, over 70% of healthcare workers uh, are women. The secondary effects refer to the downstream gender consequences of public health response to outbreaks, the disruption of routine healthcare services, particularly sexual and reproductive health services, the greater domestic care responsibilities of schools are closed and increased in gender-based violence, affordability and access to food, toilets, clean water during lockdowns, and the jeopardization of women's economic security, given that women are more likely to be in less secure employment, more likely to be in informal employment in certain sectors where the economy has been shuttered due to quarantine interventions. If we looked at, if we think about the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014 and 2015, we know that economic insecurity for female headed households were markedly higher than male households and market stallholders in particular were more likely to be occupied by women who were forced to close. Similarly, most of those raising children now with congenital Zika syndrome are single mothers, unable to return to work due to the complex needs of their children and reliant on social welfare payments. Failure to prepare for and respond to the general vulnerabilities in health emergencies demonstrates a broader systematic problem that we are seeing here with the way gender is neglected in health emergencies. And this was long before COVID-19. And I do strongly recommend you look at these beautiful videos that have been put together uh, by some of the women in particular who have been affected by the Zika outbreak. And I've provided the link there in the website and in, in the presentation. If you look at how this is affecting in terms of the way in which the World Health Organization, the leading global health institution was advising on the collection of data and response to health emergencies during this outbreak. We see the way in which gender is kind of pushed to the side, if not ignored altogether. In the case of the Zika outbreak, the focus was not always on collecting sex disaggregated data, but sometimes tending to focus more on the collection of specific data that was affecting pregnant women which then led to problems then in trying to understand the systematic way in which community incidence was working and the intersections of different vulnerabilities that were affecting risk of infection and the true incidence of who was at risk of this infection and the effects of it. Public health advice on Zika was certainly not gender inclusive and Claire has done some excellent research on this and has a book coming out detailing this in depth about the advisories that when they were issued in consideration of women were primarily around just avoid pregnancy, reduce your risk of infection through household vector control. 
the absence of recognition that gendered norms, particularly amongst poor ethnic minority communities, led to this responsibility and the blame sometimes falling primarily on women. The inclusion of a gender perspective prior to the issuing of this advice would have made it clear that demanding women control their bodies in their homes is not only insensitive, but ignorant of the gendered practices concerning sex, contraception, income and labor in the household. The exclusion of gender perspectives and health advisories had similar effects during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014 and 2015, and the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2018 and 2019. If we look at the fact too, that in the aftermath of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, an external review of the World Health Organization response led by Dame Barbara Stocking found in her review that the gendered experience of the outbreak was not considered. It was not included in particular, she noted in risk communication methods. Women, she wrote, were often not mobilized effectively in this outbreak, but they were important to this effort. And this made for us the situation in 2018 and 2019 in the Democratic Republic of Congo all the more tragic. The absence of a gender informed response in this health emergency and its consequences were visible in at least two instances that we know of. Risk communication, the false promise of access to early vaccine interventions being used by men in position of authority to procure sex from women and the identification by the International Rescue Committee in early 2020 but the health emergency response to the Ebola outbreak was failing to embed sexual and reproductive needs in its response. Despite clear interagency standing committee guidelines and the minimal, minimum initial of reproductive health it's really hard for them, so. was not being prioritized, meaning a high excess maternal and newborn morbidity and mortality and medical advice being issued that pregnancy be avoided during the EBD outbreak was not actually being able to be carried through because contraception was not being systematically offered. So then what can we think about this in terms of the recognition of the problem and seeking a path to overcome the differential gender challenge that occurs within these outbreaks? One of the things that we've seen emerged is a lot of discussion about women's representation in global health, gender parity and equality in global health affiliated organizations. And the current WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, has repeatedly advocated the importance of gender parity within the WHO Secretariat and its programs. We agree that representation is vital, but feminist change, gender inclusive practices and perspectives doesn't come from representation alone. Here we think about the feminist critique, particularly critical feminist institutions that recognize representation of course is vital, to address the historic exclusion of women and gender perspectives from decision-making. But they also require reforming organizations to adopt a critical understanding that women and the people who challenge the gender binary experience social, political, economic norms, practices and structures in unjust and unequal ways. If this is so, adding women is not enough. Gender inclusive methods and knowledge must be mainstreamed. It requires the process, the norms, the behaviors of institutions to transform, to bring tangible gendered inclusive benefits. As such, within an institution like the World Health Organization, we need to pay attention to the formal processes, to the representations, to the mandates. And we also need to be paying attention to what is happening within this institution in the informal level, what knowledge and esteem is attached to the practices of health emergencies that determined the design and the prioritization of response and including a gender mainstreamed approach to health emergencies. International organizations have pathologies, no different to state bureaucracies, political parties and civil society organizations. We know from excellent work by Barnett and Finnamore, but also others that international organizations adhere to their own rules. These rules can exist in their formal and also in their informal practices. And these rules determine the hierarchy of knowledge, attribute power, and the data collection program implementation. Sorry, Gemma, I'm just going to interrupt you. Can, can everybody make sure that their microphones are on mute, please? So can you make sure that your microphones are on mute? Because there's a few people that are interrupting the sound. Sorry, Sarah. 
things that we know is that the, the, the shared understanding of gender mainstreaming institutions actually recommend 1995 recommended that the United Nations institutions adopt a gender mainstreaming program institutions that started from the process of design through to implementation regulation. Formal gender mainstream activity does not automatically lead to gender inclusive practice policy design and implementation. Informal rules can still persist. They can perpetuate harmful discrimination and even prevent women and minority groups from promotion and entrench gender stereotypes. Informal rules from dress codes to work times to sanitation to care roles and the sexual division of labor are common informal barriers to realizing gender equality. And they're as prevalent in our United Nations institutions as they are in any other. It was the knowledge of the dual implementation of new and informal rules that was required to end gender discrimination and promote gender equality that was actually the backdrop behind the Beijing platform and the recommendation, for example, of the creation of gender advisors and women officers and states and international organizations. So like states and corporations, international organizations have their own institutional culture that sustain and enable particular modalities of operation that craft legitimacy within their narrow spaces with particular methods and knowledge production that determines what and who should be prioritized and by default, who is excluded. Institutions, including the World Health Organization is gendered and how they view and privilege power, scientific truth, theory of change, and even the technical subject matter. What we argue here is that it is possible and we need to consider that the World Health Organization has re relegated gender expertise into this narrow unit with little input into the urgent operations such as health emergency programming. The relegation of gender expertise is real and it is harmful. Many epistemological battles have been fought to recognize the inclusion of feminist methodologies in science, technology and medicine. And a review of the global gender data has found that the overall pattern of gender equality for women in science, medicine and global health is one of mixed gains and persistent challenges. Women are hired disproportionately in low income healthcare roles. There are few women in senior positions in health sciences. The consequences of this is particularly harmful, we think, in health emergencies where research and policy making remains focused on the data in the case, rather than the recognition that the cases are individuals experiencing the outbreak in a myriad of socioeconomic determinate ways. Each of the public health emergencies of international concern declared by WHO has directly affected the health of women, is required high levels of engagement from women in the community and required the delivery of risk communication messages to or about women identified as responsible given their social reproductive roles. However, gender expertise, gender sensitive data and feminist informed methodologies as Claire will show next has been absent from Hugh's response. Informed by other studies on gender global governance and epistemic community, we suggest that Hugh's gender lacuna is the result of informal institutional barriers that can be traced to these epistemological boundaries between the technical functional expertise and the political radical feminism that they are trying to keep out sometimes, sometimes unconsciously. Claire will now identify this practice in the case of the World Health Organization, where the formal inclusion of women as a quota in whose health emergency work has failed to address the ongoing exclusion of informal gender methods and knowledge from whose core work. Thank you so much, Sarah. So to carry on from where we left off, what we then went on to do in this paper is to try and understand these formal and informal mechanisms. Uh, and barriers for why we think that there hasn't been a much more systematic gender mainstreamed approach to responding to health emergencies thus far. Now, when you look at World Health Organization, we see this, this mixed tension because on the one hand, the World Health Organization does score quite favorably in many of the metrics that have been introduced to try and measure gender. So for example, we have the Global Health 5050 Gender and Health Index which recognizes that actually WHO has been quite successful at increasing women's leadership, for example, in global health. We've seen Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization, being a vocal supporter for gender equality. And indeed he has used, and he uses part of his manifesto to get elected, his excellent record uh, uh, on um, a female-focused primary healthcare system in Ethiopia when he was uh, Minister for Health in Ethiopia prior to elections. 
We've also seen much more efforts since he's been in power to try and recognize gendered issues. We've seen, for example, the much publicized um, uh, uh, 2020 as the year of the nurse and midwife in recognition of all the formal care that women provide in the global health workforce. We've also seen much more consideration of maternal and child mortality in the World Health, health Organization since he's taken, uh, in, since he's taken, uh, taken over the office. Now we can also look at the formal mechanisms that the World Health Organization has to try and mainstream gender. So in 2001, the World Health Organization adopted a commitment on gender mainstreaming. And this was then later adopted at the WHO Executive Board and the World Health Assembly in 2008. And this was a, a, a useful mechanism to try and include training, mater uh, training materials and a toolkit uh, on gender analysis for all sectors of the World Health Organization, as well as offering a gender roadmap for those, for those parts of the institution which hadn't necessarily done gender analysis before or hadn't mainstreamed any of their programs. However, by the time of 2011, so a number of years after this first came into practice, an internal review of the World Health Organization demonstrated that less than a quarter of WHO publications use sex segregated data, Few WHO units integrated gender in their implementation of programs, very little monitoring or evaluation of programs considered gender elements, and a third of public speeches from the World Health Organization mentioned gender, which meant two thirds didn't. And this report was quite damning. It concluded that the impact on day-to-day -day work of this gender mainstreaming uh, uh, commitment was indeed limited. So we suggest this is because there's a difference between the formal and informal activities that are happening. And whilst on paper we might see that the WHO is committed to gender mainstreaming, we don't necessarily see this in practice. And indeed, when they do tell you stories of the success of WHO in gender mainstreaming, it tends to focus this progress on select case studies to illustrate the success rather than presenting all the data which might reveal where programmatic gaps exist or where policy gaps exist. So we suggest that there's a data collection problem happening. So we can't accurately assess whether gender mainstreaming has occurred, and in particular, whether it's occurred in the health emergency program. Now in WHO, the, uh, the activity around gender mainstreaming sits within the Department for Equality and Human Rights. And it's quite alarming to us that this only has five people. If you think of the organization having over 2000 in the headquarters in, in Geneva, the fact that there's only five who are, who are focused solely on gender uh, reveals quite a lot about how much power or weight this activity for gender mainstreaming is given. And indeed, reflecting other issues within the World Health Organization, the activities that have been gender mainstream thus far have been very vertical, focusing on individual pillars of health. So we see activity around gender and tobacco, gender and tuberculosis, and mimicking uh, broader movements under Dr. Tedros's leadership, we see a lot of activity around gender and universal health coverage and gender in the workforce. But missing from this list prior to COVID when we started this research has been gender and health emergencies. And we think this is really illuminating. Given the volume of, of emergencies that have, have, have appeared over the last decade, and the fact that these have been you know, widely demonstrated to have significant gendered effects, both primary and secondary, as Sarah talked to, we think that, that there's a, it's an alarming that WHO has no formal position on how gender manifests within these emergencies. And so we see this gap and this absence of feminist knowledge coming from the World Health Organization in it's the way it responds to health crises. And so we need to interrogate this further and really try and understand the mismatch of the institutional governance and the gender inclusive response for those at risk in infection, particularly if we position WHO as this norm entrepreneur for coordinated health emergencies. We really need to push WHO to consider this gendered, uh, gendered effects and gender mainstreaming of their policies around health emergencies more um, in, 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 in much more detail. So in particular, when we think about governing health emergencies within the World Health Organization, the first place we looked at was the international health regulations as the central framework for responding to uh, outbreaks of emergency, uh, outbreaks of infectious disease, which might um, become public health emergencies of international concern. Now this framework systematically neglects gender. We see women and gender mentioned twice, but only either as a category of travelers whose rights must be protected through travel and trade, through, through travel restrictions under Article 32. And in Article 50, which recommends there must be gender parity 
on the IHR review committee. If that, that isn't extended, for example, to the IHR emergency committees, which decide which outbreaks should be considered a public health emergency of international concern. And indeed, when we look over the representation of these panels that have uh, taken effect since 2009, we do see increasing gender parity on the committee members who comprise these emergency committees. So for H1N1 in 2009, there are only two, out of, two women out of 15 members on that committee panel. Now, by 2018-19, when the emergency, uh, the emergency committee was convened for the Ebola outbreak in DRC, we saw almost uh, equal gender parity. So we do see there is progress towards recognizing gender parity within these panels. However, we've only ever seen one female chair of these, um, of these committees, which was for polio. And so we see that there's a tension here between gender parity and gender inclusion. And we see that what we're actually seeing on these panels is indeed uh, much more uh, women's representation than it is really, really providing evidence of gender mainstreaming within health emergencies. More importantly, given the lack of transparency in the emergency committee's processes, we have no indication of how inclusive these committee meetings actually are, whether women get the same opportunity to voice their concerns as much, whether indeed any consideration of the gendered downstream effects of outbreaks is talked about. And indeed, thinking about uh, intersectionality, intersectional, intersectional perspectives, the, women's on these, in, the women who do participate in these emergency committees tend to be elite, highly educated, professionalized, and more likely to come from the global north or have been educated there. And thus they represent an elite social group to facilitate their recognition in the WHO processes. And they too may overlook some of the structural constraints and individual constraints that women are placed under during outbreak conditions. Similarly, if we look at the uh, health emergencies program within the uh, WHO, WHO we see a tension around how they talk about gender mainstreaming. Indeed, we do see a lot of efforts in the recent years to try and ensure, uh, so try and ensure greater representation in the health emergencies program. Indeed, the reports have shown that there are 55% of women who comprise the health emergencies program, but senior representation within the program only drops down to 27%. But again, representation is presented as the primary measure of gender inclusion in the programmatic activity. There is very limited detail or evidence of them considering the gendered effects rather than a, a self-referential discussion around who's actually working there. And so we see that there's this problematic tension with, between this ad women and stir amid WHO activity, which uh, equals uh, inclusion and gender inclusion in the activities. We also looked at other areas of IHR implementation. So for example, the state parties assessment reporting SPA tool uh, have no reference to gender considerations in capacity building, preparedness or outbreak response. There is no requirement to collect sex surrogated data within report reporting emergencies to the uh, World Health Organization. And in the joint external evaluations uh, exercises of states performance in meeting the international health regulation, there's also no, consider uh, no consideration of gender equality in the workforce, in risk communication, in human rights legislation and human resourcing. And so we see this widespread absence of gender across both the workforce and across the uh, tools that are uh, designed to respond to outbreaks of infectious diseases. So we suggest that this gap between the formal participation and the inclusion of gender knowledge methods and approaches confirms that while equal, equal representation matters, women's participation in the World Health Organization for, in the health emergencies activities is, is not the same as creating a space formally or informally for feminist knowledge. And this is fundamentally at odds indeed with the World Health Organization's own gender strategy, which states that programs are responsible for analyzing the role of gender and sex in their areas of work and for developing an appropriate gender specific response in all strategic objectives and the continuing uh, basis on a continuing basis. So we think we need to hold not only the World Health Organization accountable for this absence, but indeed the, the health emergencies program itself, because that's where the responsibility lies to do something about it. So when we then think about this in the coronavirus outbreak, 
We also want to see what has changed because we do see the coronavirus outbreak as a potential for changing the way the World Health Organization engages with gender and indeed gender mainstreams the response to health emergencies. So whilst in the initial months of the outbreak this year, we didn't see much consideration within the World Health Organization of the gendered effects of the pandemic. Uh, the response was almost, ex almost um, exclusively focused on the epidemiological, on infection prevention, surveillance, laboratory testing, risk communication and clinical management. However, by April this year, we started to welcome some important seeds of change in, re in recognition of the differential impacts of outbreaks on women and other marginalized groups. So we saw a whole bunch of research coming out from civil society, from researchers, from UN agencies and offices detailing gendered vulnerabilities to both contracting the virus and the secondary effects of the virus. Uh, and indeed, we have then seen formal reports coming out from uh, international organizations, including the UN Secretary, Secretary General, UN Women, the World Bank, IMF, and indeed WHO itself. And by May this year, Dr. Tedros, through the um, International Health Regulations Emergency Committee statement, raised concern about the impact the outbreak was having on both gender-based violence and women's ability to access sexually reproductive health services. Now, this to us seems as a, as a key moment because this is the first time the emergency committee has actively recognized the gendered effects of an outbreak. And even if you think back to the Zika outbreak a few years ago, which was so expressly about women, those, those recommendations didn't consider issues such as sexual reproductive health in the emergency committee response. So we see this as a, as a key turning stone. And indeed, by September this year, Dr. Tedros held an audience with Women in Global Health and Gender to form a gender and COVID working group um, to try and understand some of these tensions further. Now, these are important steps, but there still remains no formal institutional process that ensures that the Emergency Committee, the IHR and the Health Emergency Programme consider the vulnerabilities which women and marginalised groups face during outbreaks. And indeed, there's not a legacy of informal rules that legitimise the inclusion of gender knowledge in health emergency policy development. So we don't really see that the media attention and the policy briefings have translated into wholesale institutional change yet. And we've also not seen any trickle down effect on this to commit to country level monitoring of gendered effects of, of, of COVID health advice and policy. Now, we also asked this question of why are we seeing this change now? We were both um, you know, interested to see why the WHO had never thought to consider gendered effects during the Ebola outbreak in, in West Africa or in DRC, and indeed during the Zika outbreak. And depending on how cynical we're feeling, there may be many reasons for this. However, one of the key concerns we have is that because this outbreak is now affecting people globally and importantly women in the global north and indeed women who work within the WHO system, this might uh, illuminate why we're seeing this change now. That suddenly people are recognizing the gendered effects because they are living the gendered effects of this outbreak. And whilst it might not matter why this recognition has happened and we welcome it happening at any stage. The concern is how do we ensure that these are maintained and go beyond simply Global North understanding of gendered effects and ensure that actions uh, to mitigate against the gendered effects fall uniformly across the globe and try and ensure that there's greater inclusion and ensure that the global health community recognize the further intersections of gender equality in the response. And so, to come to a conclusion of our thoughts here, we really think that World Health Organization must be a thought leader in thinking about gender mainstreaming across the uh, outbreaks to, of infectious diseases. We see in the outbreaks of Zika and Ebola that the exclusion of feminist knowledge and methods from the World Health Organization's advice, response and communication led to clear gender adjustances against women across the world. And COVID might be the opportunity to right some of those wrongs, but gender mainstreaming requires a much more institutional deep change within the World Health Organization to both their formal and informal mechanisms for responding to outbreaks. So we suggest that as this normative leader in health emergencies, WHO must reformulate public health recommendations to identify the gender intersectional risks specific to each outbreak. And we suggest this must happen within the international health regulation. So to date, there is currently no gender analysis framework which informs WHO's emergency response. And so we need to push for this to happen and we need to push for this to happen within the international health regulations. 
Now, Sarah and I disagree about exactly how to do this um, and whether we need a whole new article within the international health regulations expressly, uh, expressly recognizing the differential gendered effects or whether we just need to push for more from Article 3 around human rights to ensure that human rights are inclusive and expressly inclusive of uh, women's rights and those of other genders. But beyond this, we also need to make sure that when, we, when WHO do talk about gender, they're not simply talking about representation. And we need to make sure that there is not, we should, we should obviously push for gender parity on all these committees within the World Health Organization and within the Health Emergency Program. But inclusion doesn't only require women at the table, but gender sensitive data collection and indeed gender advisors. And there's precedent within the UN system. So for example, the Interagency Standing Committee requires a gender specialist to be in attendance during emergency phase response meetings and requiring inclusion and adoption of gender methods. And so there's no reason why this shouldn't be extended to the way that WHO responds to health emergencies. Indeed, this was recommended by the UN Global Health Committee Task Force in 2017. We also need to push for greater transparency in the institutional procedures that declare and advise on how health emergencies uh, occur and to make sure that we, we recognize that these are taken into account. And finally, we need to recognize that public health emergencies occur within societies and that we need to move beyond simply thinking about positive methods and po positive epistemologies premised on, epidemi on epidemiology and virology in responding to outbreaks. This, should, this is the gold standard currently, but we need more than that. We need to ensure there's gender inclusive methods in data collection, in health emergency preparedness and in public health recovery planning. And this requires an expansion of recognition of whose knowledge matters and whose knowledge is valued. And we need to think about social science in this. We specifically recommend that we should include feminist methodologies such as ethnography, participant observation, storytelling, participatory action research to really try and understand the barriers, concerns and enablers that will determine access to and belief in the healthcare sex solutions provided to end outbreaks. We thank you so much for your time. We hope we've given you some seeds for thought and please do reach out to us and we really look forward to all your questions that are coming from here. Sarah, do you want to stop sharing your screen? I'll do that right now. <laughs> I'm sure I can use a button here. So, well, on behalf of everybody, I'd like to say thank you very much for such an insightful and interesting talk. And I'm sure there's lots of questions from everybody. Just to remind people again, if we can try and put the questions in the chat, and then I'll invite you to come and um, speak to us um, so if you'd be prepared to unmute yourself, maybe turn the video on if, if you feel prepared to, to do that. Um, and then Claire and Sarah will try and get through as many questions as possible. And if I can say, with the questions, if you can try and keep them concise and framed as a question, that would be helpful. But also do introduce just who you are and where, where you come from in terms of your institution. Could I just say while people are collecting their thoughts, I want to sincerely thank you, Emma, for organising this today. I really appreciate it. I don't think I said that at the beginning and I wanted to, and I wanted to also thank the schools and the centres as well for their support in organising this event. So thank you. Sarah and Claire, do let me know if I'm missing questions. I've got it on. This reminds me of when I was lecturing and I used to ask questions and then there was always a long gap while people were furiously typing them in while I was teaching. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we are taking questions now later. I just saw, I think that's our, how's your name, sorry? I think it's just a good sign that we must have such a compelling argument that there can simply be no question from it, right? Well, furious disagreement and everyone's too <laughs> polite. <Sorry. laughs> 
<laughs> We've got a question now from Sabrina. Sabrina, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Good to see Hello. you. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it's, it's, it's really, really um, fantastic that you're doing this kind of work. Um, so I'm a PhD student at the University of Leeds. Um, and similarly, um, looking at the response of international institutions to gender related staff. And I just you know, have the impression that generally international organizations and their subsidiaries are bad at understanding gender. Um, and they're bad at understanding gender mainstreaming and, and, and many of the critiques that you that you meticulously laid out um, around needing stronger institutional change. I feel like that this is something that I have heard before that's sort of part of a bigger push um, in R2P, in peacekeeping, um, in WHA staff. So I guess my question to you is, is that, you know, wonderful that you're doing this on this specific topic. Oh. Um, but but how do we how do we really push <laughs> these organizations um, to do better at this? Is it a matter of taking all of these topical areas and pushing for all of these little changes, um, or do we do we just need do we also need to keep um, shouting at longer term institutional and cultural change needed? I go first. Yeah. So this could be controversial, Sabrina, but I'm of the view after having done this paper that I've been quite harsh on some of the other international organizations that I've looked at in the past when it comes to gender maintenance. It's been quite shocked since of gender perspectives and gender bias and in the practical sort of just the assemblage of the advice that is meant to be then informing response. Uh, so thinking about some of the areas that you mentioned, Sabrina, particularly in the women, peace and security area, I mean, it would be very difficult now, and there has been controversy, right, about should gender advisors still be in all civil, all civilian, all these kinds of really important debates have happened, but there've been debates about the presence. Um, what's striking here is the absence. Um, and for me, that's the thing that's been quite concerning. Uh, and in terms of where we go next, I mean, I think, you know, for, unfortunately, crisis sometimes does require these questions to be asked and compels the question to be asked, where, where is this advice and why is it absent? Um, so we approach this as a critical friend, I would argue, in the language of Fiona Mackay and, and Louise Chappell, you know, this is about it needs to be there and, and we really would like it to be there, please. And there's certainly the argument that it's something that states will oppose or don't agree with or they can't have it. We're not convinced by that, particularly in the World Health Organization. That tends to be the argument. It's a technical, you know, it's, it's not about making these sorts of political entries. This is something that has been put forward from 1995, actually prior to that 1992, that all UN institutions and agencies and offices are to have a gender perspective in their programs. Um, so for us, it's just about asking for it more and more loudly. Claire, did you want to come in? Oh, I agree. I think the only thing I'd add to that is I think that um, WHO probably think they're doing it with representation stuff. So I think it's just about telling them what they need. I don't think they, I don't think from my um, interactions with the World Health Organization that they are actively anti doing more towards gender. I think they just don't necessarily know what they need. And I think they have such a small team trying to do so much. They simply haven't got capacity to think about it more uh, holistically. And uh, given their funding structures and no one funds gender, they're not doing more of it. So I think it's you know about laying out exactly how they can be more gender inclusive in their, their program activities, which is what we're trying to do in this paper is kind of give them a, a, a hand. Because I think we both agree with WHO being the kind of normative leader in global health security and, you know, trying to facilitate that and ensure that they are not sidelining women in their Stefan, um, joining us from Germany. Sussex, do you want to ask your question? Good to see you. Lovely to see all of you uh, again, even if virtually. Thank you very much for a fantastic talk. Um, my question is not so much about this, the specifics of the analysis uh, that you have advanced, but more about 
the kind of the broader context, uh, especially because you guys brought up also the, the notion of, of, you know, gender intersectionality. And so my question really is only, um, you know, what is gained and what is lost by focusing exclusively on gender rather than on the, the combination and combinations of gender, race, class, etc. Because I think a lot of the things that you're saying also echo more widely than just this gender. There, there are multiple exclusions that come together in, in different ways. And so I can kind of see benefits and drawbacks to teasing one out, but I can also see, you know, it's, it's difficult. So I just, I just wonder what your thoughts are about that. Thank you. Do you want me to jump in, Sarah, or do you want to go? Uh, thanks, Stefan. Uh, great to see you. And that's a really important question. I mean, Sarah might disagree with me. I think that all of these are important intersections and we shouldn't belittle any of them. But I think that um, if you're looking at institutional change and you're looking at ways of making the institution and the frameworks that are developed to respond to outbreaks more inclusive, then methodologies that have been well established in gender analysis and in feminist research are a useful tool for understanding any intersection. So if you can try and mainstream the, the data that's collected and try and engage more with social science methods and try and engage more in different uh, ways of understanding how people experience outbreaks, whether that is because of their, their gender, their race, their location, their class, I think that's a useful, uh, you know, a, a useful tool to ensure is implemented in any health emergency and then all those vulnerable groups can be identified and all the ways that people experience outbreaks can be identified systematically and then incorporated into the programs that are developed to mitigate against them. Sarah? I do. Uh, <laughs> thanks Stefan for the question. I also think too, you know, what's lost? What's lost by not including this? I would say Gender's the start, uh, but then yes, I would agree that this is this, and as Claire said, what this allows us to then open up is the scope for thinking about the possibility that perhaps public health is not being delivered the same way to every single member of the population that's being affected by the outbreak right now. So the potential actually is that you will get better intervention. You'll get a response that's more adaptive and recognize, you know, recognizes the, the variation that you have across populations. So to me, gender is the point at which we start to open up the possibility that we have different receptions, different populations receiving messages differently, thinking about whether or not they're going to get tested and, and how they're going to navigate trying, going to get tested differently. It just opens up from, 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 from my perspective, it opens up the recognition that people are receiving and be, the information differently, they're being affected by it differently, and their choices are very different as well uh, in, in response to health emergencies, how the, you know, how they navigate their way through. Um, so for me, it's, it's, it's what is gained, but it's also about, I think at the moment, we need to recognize what is being lost by not looking at this. And I think it's COVID-19 has actually shown in the first surge, what was lost by not having a human rights frame. We've got a question from Sala Rusi from the University of Leeds. Hi there. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hi, Sarah. I'm just thinking in terms of, and Claire as well, sorry. I'm just thinking in terms of the responses, um, you know, in terms of how to enhance the gender responsiveness um, in terms of um, the World Health Organizations, but also health interventions in um, in humanitarian emergencies, and whether actually the Women, Peace and Security uh, framework is actually the right platform to try and get the uh, World Health Organizations more responsive in terms of um, in terms of gender, um, and whether if we try perhaps to try and use the uh, Women, Peace and Security platform, whether this can have implications on the agenda itself, considering, uh, for instance, the United States approach to the World Health Organization at this time of crisis. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
That's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, I was actually asked about this as another webinar last night. <laughs> and uh, for me, the, you know, resolution uh, 2532, what it, I got the order right, didn't I, Claire? What that resolution, what was important about it was the inclusion of, you know, the fact that, that women's perspective needs to be brought in and women's experiences and different groups, marginalised groups experience of COVID-19 needs to be brought into the planning. And we've been avidly watching to see to what extent that recommendation the Security Council has come across into the work of the World Health Organisation. Um, it's not particularly clear at the moment, um, but I think, you know, relief and recovery pillar of the Women, Peace and Security uh, resolution is an area in particular that we know in general um, has struggled to sometimes be given the same voice and recognition and financing as some of the other areas. And I think this is one in particular in the health emergency space. There's a real, there's a real potential here for UN Women and World Health Organization to think about how to craft a really important understanding of responses you know, and CEDAW as well. I mean, that for me is the other thing that's been frustrating about this. You know, the CEDAW committee has been making recommendations around health emergencies now for a, for a number of years, decades actually. And that's also not translating across into the working of the World Health Organization. So I think too, what we're seeing as well is, you know, that inevitable practice of silos occurring across the agencies and the institutions. And that's really problematic. And one of my concerns actually is with the funding, with the difficulties around cooperation, we may see this more. And so I think you're right, you know, trying to talk more about the cross linkages is really important. Um, Claire and I were going to do that in a paper that we've done recently, but we pulled ourselves back and we stuck to the IHR instead. But, but that was a really great point. Thank you. Thank you. And we've got David Jury Smith joining us from Sheffield. Hi, um, my Good, good to see you, Sarah and Claire. My, my question is about whether you've seen any hope that the gender mainstreaming framework is including conversations about men's gendered behaviour as well, rather than just on gender as difference from a sort of presumed gender neutral norm. I particularly had in mind men's risk taking behaviour and lack of health seeking behaviour, as well as the tendency due to masculinity for men to discount other voices and, and perspectives that aren't framed as being um, expert? Um, thanks, it's a really good question. Um, I think I, maybe Sarah can jump in and tell me if you think I'm missing something. I haven't seen anything expressly come from the World Health Organization about this, but that we are seeing a lot of this literature coming out from um, other governments and other men's health organizations, for example, during this crisis. So particularly um, unique to COVID, for example, we know that men are less likely to wash their hands, they're less likely to socially distance, they're less likely to, um, in the UK, they're less likely to adhere to um, self-isolation restrictions if they've been contacted through track and trace. Um, and so we are seeing, you know, these, distinct gendered effects of outbreaks and of the public health recommendations that are made. And so there are some efforts to ensure that risk communication is gendered in that respect. But what's quite interesting is that that is the conversation that's happening and not thinking about how to make sure that risk communication for the gendered effects which affect women are being risk communicated in the same way. So in a way you could argue the fact that these are being recognized within some governments is further um, evidence of the way that gender is perceived and you know what's excluded from these conversations I think is quite an important thing to point out but I haven't seen anything happening from the World Health Organization on that. No I haven't and I think it's it's again it's a it's a demonstration as well of just the, the limited way in which it's being thought about unfortunately at the moment because again as Claire said there's high risk here and there's a lot of important knowledge that we need to have that we're not getting. We've got Jeremy Yude joining us in the early hours of the morning from Minnesota. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the, this great paper, Claire and Sarah. This was really thought provoking and, and a great way to start the day. And I'm curious, um, you know, let's say that, that, that we, you know, I, I think that, that you're right. You know, this isn't something that WHO or the IHR has, you know, has they've not taken gender seriously. And so if we want to make that, that move so that they are actually doing this, 
what, where do you think the impediments are coming up? Is it the structure of the organization? Is it the fact that no one wants to reopen the, I, the IHR because they were so hard to get to that point? Um, is it that there's no country or group of countries that have stepped up? Is there still just this lingering sense that gender is this peripheral issue that you know we talk about it, but we don't really want it. It's not something that we're really willing to engage with seriously. Where do you think the, 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 the barriers are popping up? Hi, Jeremy. Thanks for getting up so early. Um, and lovely to see everyone, actually. Thank you. It's lovely to see so many good friends. Um, can I say all of that? <laughs> and cut that? No. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> for me, there's a couple of, there's probably three that I'd probably pick out at the moment. Um, the first, and Claire, you then jump in. The first one, I, I do think knowledge matters here. And Jeremy, you've done a lot of work on this with epistemic communities. And I do think it's really hard, right, when a lot of your legitimacy is wrapped around a mandate that is around a very technical sort of delivery. And it's, you know, and you're constantly trying to make this balance between how far can I go out here? You've got health ministries and you've got, you know, so the way in which it's structurally set up, I do think is important second concern as well. So first of all, I think knowledge, the, the terrain that you're in and where you feel comfortable. And, you know, and there's been a lot of discussion in the health area around the way in which gender is sometimes thought about in the public health space, not always in particularly enlightened ways. Um, then I think in terms of the structure, yeah, it's a problem for them because you've got health ministries and then you've also got the way in which the World Health Organization privileges professionals. It's all about public health expertise. So I think, again, you know, you're sort of reinforcing then the knowledge, the knowledge, the community of thought, you know, shared thinking. And so there's no one stepping in and saying, hang on, you know, <laughs> there's been a whole other world going on out here. Uh, you know, the Wind Peace and Security Agenda, the Beijing platform, maybe we could bring some of this in. Um, and then I think the third thing, which is, is, the, is the reforms, and this is where Claire and I differ a bit, because I do think from 2011, there has been repeated reviews of the international health regulations, making it quite clear that there's a human rights article in there that no one's talking enough about, you know, so the H1N1 review said, we've got a human rights article here. Why isn't this in the evaluation? Dame Barbara Stocking said, you know, we've got human rights here. You know, we've got gender, you know, we've got sort of the framework here to be talking about it. Um, you know, the Global Health Security Panel that the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon set up said, spent seven pages talking about gender and the need to bring it in. So for me, then there's, um, that then comes, so for me, we don't need to reform the IHR, we've got it. I think what we've got to do is just be a little, we've got to then address one and two, you know, the knowledge and the structure, and then think about how to bring it in. That's my view anyway. Claire? Yeah, I mean, so I think it's two things. I think that, um, uh, well, I, I agree with what Sarah said, but I think with the IHR reform, I think it's a question of it just hasn't happened yet. I mean, I think COVID is inevitably going to reopen the IHR, whether whether we want it to or not. And I know Sarah's nervous about it because Sarah thinks if you reopen the treaty, then you might lose some of the gains. Even you might lose the human rights article, right? You like who knows what would happen. But I think it's basically got to be. It's going to have to be reopened now. Um, and so why not push to have a whole article around gender in the IHR, right? And make it really explicit and. I think my read on this is that the reason it hasn't happened this far is that just people haven't thought about it enough and they think oh gender yeah well look we've got more you know we're doing lots of reviews around how many women we've got in the room tick right and I think it's just let's 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 make it really explicit so that no one can avoid it anymore and I think the other problem um, is that some of the leadership in the World Health Organization and not um, you know, just the leader, but you know, at multiple levels within the health emergencies program, within IHR committees, don't understand gender, right? And again, just think, oh, well, you know, I'm a woman, so therefore we've got gender in here. And don't recognize that being a woman doesn't mean you understand gender, right? In the same way that being a man doesn't mean you understand gender. And we really need to make it more explicit and kind of give that guidance to people to, to take it one step further beyond representation because I think otherwise they sort of think their job's done and that's not enough. We've got um, Katia Confortini joining us from Massachusetts. It's a shame this wasn't Hawaii because we should have all met there. <laughs> Katia, are you able to join us? 
think she said that she she wasn't worried if she couldn't answer the ask the question in person. Okay. Do you want to read it or shall I read it for you? It's okay. So, Claire, oh. did you I spoke first last time? Did you want to go? Oh. I'm still trying to find it. Go go. Okay, so it's following on from Sabrina's question earlier. So in the spirit of feminist reflexivity, I wonder if there's something we feminists are not doing right in communicating and researching gender so that it remains hard for the INC, it's hard for international institutions to get gender. Yes, I agree, Katia, and that's why for me, I mean, the, the article that I kept coming back to in my head was the Fiona Mackay and Louise Chappell article about being the critical friend and what does it take to be a critical friend and how do you do it in a way where for us, one of the things that we were talking a lot about during this article is, and Claire was talking about it just before, is it that they don't get it? Is it that they just don't understand it? And maybe what it is is just trying to gently <laughs> sort of explain again and again um, what that means, the difference between representation and you know and inclusion and perspective and trying to sort of just broaden it out a little bit from perhaps the spaces where they feel comfortable um but i also think too it's also sometimes about the more critical part of the friend so that's the friend but the more critical part is actually then also making it very clear it's not there and that's where i think you know there is some similarities if we think about the humanitarian space and you know there's you know so again i don't want to sugarcoat this and this comes back to sabrina's point you know in the humanitarian space, you know, when you, those of you who do interviews with humanitarian workers in the gender space, you know, they always talk about the fact that they get shoved at the, at the end of the back of the room, they get the least budget, they're the voices that are always marginalised. So, you know, it's not that I'm trying to say that everyone else is sorted and, and the World Health Organization does it. I think it what it, the emergency environment in particular has this really toxic way as well of sort of you know, trying to condense what is the what, triage, you know, <laughs> and, and gender is one that can't, tends to get out. And for me, what it's about is trying to also post-crisis sometimes may be more useful and preparing for the next crisis, making it very clear where the opportunities were missed and where the, you know, why what we're seeing right now with that important article by the New Humanitarianism about what happened in the DRC and identifying that when you have a rush of money, when you have a growth industry, you know, when you're trying to exercise this response in a very fragile situation, you can actually contribute to significant harms. Um, so I think, again, you know, at the moment with COVID-19, it's very tempting to kind of make it all about what's happening right now, but I actually think all of us will be really important to be there at some point afterwards, if there's an afterwards, and be going back and looking at where, where, the, where the process happened and where there were moments where choices were not made around knowledge collection in this area and what impact it has had in local environments sometimes. So that really important local understanding is going to be, I think, really important in this uh, effort at the moment. And that's where, again, feminist methods, I think, is, is, is wonderfully suitable to, to this work. I think the only thing I'd add, I mean, I agree with everything Sarah said, but I think the other thing is that um, there's a big space of people working on gender and outbreaks at the moment. And you see maybe some of the louder voices, um, uh, such as like Women in Global Health and Global Health 5050, which are great at what they do, but they're focused on representation and counting women. And so there's the risk that, you know, if that's what, that's what people think gender is, and that's what people think they should be doing, and they're the ones who've got the the ears of those in power, then that's what will happen. And I wonder whether thinking more holistically about the gendered effects of outbreaks and indeed not limiting that to women, but also including uh, you know, the gendered effects on men and on non-binary groups is, it just isn't getting shouted loud enough or into the right ears enough. And that might be one of the problems. And then Lata here at Leeds has got a question. Yes, hi, thank you. First of all, I, I, I'm sorry I'm late, but I've had a, a, a skim of the paper or what I could find online. And also I, I was here for about the, sort of the last 20 minutes, but I'm listening to your answers and 
really appreciate that you're talking about this because I've, I've been in a few spaces just lately where we all, we do seem to have moved back to the, oh, well, let's make sure we have women in the room and that job is done. So that's very, very frustrating. Um, and it's extraordinary that we're still there, actually. Uh, I suppose my question is uh, really about the sort of the, the and I think Owain seems to have said something quite similar. So obviously I'll, ask, I'll let him ask his question, but the sort of similar kinds of issues, which is the sort of the, the, the wider political economy of, of gender and health, because in a way, there's no incentive to deal with gender, right? There's lots of unpaid care work being done. Why not? Unless I really have to, unless somebody really, really says, look, you know, I don't know. The, it, or it has some sort of knock on effect in ways that might matter to the people that are making the decisions. So I suppose, I suppose the question is, how, what are the ways in which we can communicate not only the value of everything that you're saying, which I agree with 100%, it isn't just about women in the room, but actually thinking about gender inequality, intersectionality, we need a more substantive intervention. But in a way, the challenge, and particularly what's been really funny about this pandemic is that lots of people actively saying that we're not going to listen to the who, and actually that's okay, which I'm also, you know, entire states sort of going, well, we know who they are, so we're just going to defund them, you know. So actually thinking that that authority doesn't matter, or that there isn't a value in having a coordinated public health response at all. So within that, how do we make that case in a way that might influence states who maybe don't want to take gender seriously, either because it doesn't suit their ideology or because it, it's actually, in terms of the risk of, I don't know, the cost of, I don't know, paying for the unpaid caring labor, whatever, like, how do you make that, how do we influence that space where actually those decisions are being made and actually this issue is being ignored? Thank you. And thanks for the talk. And again, I'm sorry I was late. Claire, do you want to go now? Or? If you like. Um, oh, thanks. Just go, go back on mute. Leave it to me. Thank you. That's a really, um, a really important question, and I guess it's something that we haven't maybe thought about enough in this paper. Um, so I completely agree. There are definitely states who don't want to think about gender, uh, as you've exactly pointed out, right? Like you know, having women do lots of free labour is great. Having women do lots of care and community health workers as unpaid carers as parents whatever it is you know is great and indeed you know um the fact that loads of women are you know in fact that we're seeing widespread unemployment as a consequence of this outbreak that's heavily gendered mainly because of both the macro facts that it's the sectors of the economy that women work in that have been the ones that have been shut down so like tourism and restaurants and, and hotels and they predominantly employ women and so women have lost jobs more than men and we're seeing that really acutely in all the statistics in the UK around furlough in the US around um, unemployment statistics and you know maybe it's a uh, it's convenient right that then when you start to have to you know for example one of the conversations I've been having here in the UK is that when governments then get asked to do something to encourage women back into the workforce and that tends to be some you know affordable childcare, for example and governments don't do it and you know that's good for their statistics because then those people aren't unemployed anymore they are simply out of the workforce and not looking for work so then that's a good way of showing that you, your employment isn't so bad and you haven't dealt with the gender consequences but who cares right and so there are all those things at play here but i think what's the alternative right like not saying anything and never mentioning it and not trying to hold states to account is it's not gonna that's not gonna solve it either and so I think, yes, absolutely, you need to consider the geopolitical reality in the in the political economy of all of this. But what's the alternative if you if you don't say anything? Yeah, that, that was the question I was dreading, actually. <laughs> because that's true, you know, it's World Health Organization says stuff, who cares, you know? <laughs> You know, they say pay, pay attention to gender. States are going to do what they want to do anyway. I mean, I suppose one of the things that I would say, though, is particularly in a little bit 
um, is that in the health emergency space, actually, a lot of the majority of states have moved heaven and earth in some respects. And I know we don't talk about this much at the moment because of the COVID-19, but there was an attempt, you know, to really try and think about these IHRs and these core capacity criteria. We've now had nearly 100 countries signing up to joint evaluation exercises. So we, even if it's just performative, even if it's just tick and flick, why not add gender? You know, like if it is just a tick and flick exercise, that in me, you know, I think that. So I'm kind of like, I am puzzled by the fact that given we have got this plethora of activity that's been happened for the last 20, 25 years around gender, you know, it's such an, you know, you can add it in. Um, so why hasn't it been? And in, in the acknowledgement of the fact that, you know, it, it could be like all the other 13 core capacity criteria that aren't going to necessarily be implemented to their fullest extent as well. So for me, it is, it is even in the, even in the, even if we accept a core health organization is not that powerful, if most states just nod and do what they want to do, um, the absence of a normative actor in the World Health Organization trying to say, we've got to do this, we should be doing this, you know. Um, that for me is interesting, even if there's opponents uh, to it, 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 to me, the fact that from what we've tried to find anyway, it doesn't seem to have been, the, the dots don't seem to have been connected in, in, within the institution itself and for that, in the organisation itself. And for me, that's, that's puzzling and concerning in equal measures. <laughs> Can I use this point just to encourage any of our students to ask a question? Because um, we haven't had any from our undergraduates yet. So, and I know that there's quite a lot here that potentially have a question relating to this. So do use this as an opportunity to, to uh, pose a question to Claire and Sarah. Um, and we do have a, a question from Owen Williams, who has very recently joined us at the University of Leeds. Hi, um, can you hear me? me yeah um anyway i'll push on um thanks to the friends for their excellent presentation and in no way is this a critique of of their presentation or or the normative thrust of it but in in some ways it resonates with uh stefan's point um is any of this really a surprise um you know we on the one hand we have a politically and certainly financially uh emasculated who um, that's member driven um, in, in much of its uh, goals and, and so, certainly donor um, uh, driven in terms of its, its outlook, its programmatic outlook. On the other hand, we have, you know, the IHRs and the WHO itself, you know, increasingly we see in other forms of governance and institutions at the multilateral level, this kind of neoliberal drift to a dry, technocratic and largely depoliticized type of governance of issue areas. And the international health regulations and the WHO, you know, are, 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 are part of this depoliticization, which, you know, are the front line in dealing with health emergencies. It's not just uh, the Médecins Sans Frontières and uh, the other kind of sexy actors that fly in and, and prevent pandemics it's it's um it's it's health systems and all of these have been stripped out by uh, neoliberal cuts and austerity and the ihrs are, are silent on on largely silent on health systems they're largely silent on issues of margin marginalization of the social determinants of health all silence and so in a way it's it, 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 as much as I support your um, critique and the need for change in the WHO and other international organizations, this is part and parcel, I believe, of a neoliberal process of depoliticization and technocratic meta, meta governance. Thanks very much. Thanks, Owen. I mean, for me, I guess I would. I don't necessarily accept the premise of the question as my as my friend because I guess I don't I don't think the World Health Organization this look there's a lot of criticisms of the World Health Organization at the moment we know the budget issues that it's had it's had for a long time um, but 
I also am a little bit of the view as well, you know, based on, you know, work by Nitsan Churov, even Tani Heinrader, that, that the institutions, they, this organization makes decisions, you know, and the people working in it do make decisions about what they're going to prioritize and how they're going to manage even those extra budgetary arrangements um and you know and that, there's been a you know the major donors you know even if we take out the you know the trump administration i mean uh, there's been a number and if you look at the oecd like donation donor money in terms of gender space has actually been going up and a lot of countries in the donor space that are quite generous to the world health organization are, have been seeking to increase investments in the space as well so cynically cynically you could say this is you know this is the cash this is a cash cow that they should be jumping on you know cynically you could um so for me again I, i'm not entirely sure that i buy in, in entirely to the idea that the World Health Organization has been hollowed out in the direction and that the Director General in particular, um, you know, has no uh, capacity in this area to be able to think about um, what it, what's going to be in the Health Emergencies Program directors, that they can't have these conversations and thoughts about the way in which they're going to formulate and provide advice. Um, that's for me. I just, as I said, I've, I, I do think, based on this work that we've seen from others, looking at the way in which health, World Health Organization has thought about the crafting of mandates and thought about the crafting of particular programs in the past, that there is a consciousness there in what they what they attach and what they don't attach, what they include and what they exclude. Um, and 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 I do think that's happened here. Yeah, and I think I just, I mean, I agree. I think I just add that, you know, if we look at kind of formal and informal mechanisms, you know, even if there were no formal mechanisms to try and um, mainstream gender more through things like the IHR because of the, you know, budget costs or because of the kind of implications for other sectors or other areas of the health system, for example, um, you could have seen if they were already committed to it, you would have seen it happening informally. Right, in terms of, of what, what was actually happening within the organization or um, uh, efforts to improve uh, or focus on areas of gender that they are working on, such as UHC. Um, so I think the fact we're not seeing that either speaks volumes to a much more systemic problem within the organization rather than just saying, you know, is it, is it a result of, of kind of cutbacks within the system? We've got another question from Katia. Um, Katia, I'm sorry for not seeing your chat before to say that you couldn't unmute. So is there the same hostility to gender in the field as there is in post-conflict and or development settings? I'm reluctant to answer that one only because I haven't yet done interviews. And I feel like at this point, the next point of this, in, you know, like I've talked to people informally about it in the World Health Organization, and I've talked to people informally about it in the ministries that represent, you know, that are represented at the World Health Organization. Um, but I, I'm a bit cautious to say at this point that it's equal to or less or more. And in, Anecdotally, is it's mentioned less <laughs> unless I bring it up. Um, that for me is the thing that I found perhaps most interesting, particularly when I was writing my book containing contagion. Um, you know, it just didn't really come up <laughs> unless I asked. Uh, whereas, you know, in the other area, post-conflict and develop, it, it comes up a lot. <laughs> um, and again, that that's that's just my personal observation. Claire? I think the other thing just to add, I mean, I don't have the answer to that question uh, either, but I think it was also an interesting question to see how gender is um, framed when it does come up. So certainly in previous health emergencies, when people talk about, and it's not WHO talking about it, that they haven't really talked about gender in previous health emergencies, as we've shown. But when you do start having that conversation around gender and health emergencies, and indeed we're seeing it in during COVID, what that what that equals. And so it tends to equal gender-based violence or it tends to equal disruption to sexual reproductive health services. Now, I'm not suggesting those aren't important. They obviously are, 
but I think there's quite a narrow understanding of what gender and health emergencies is by quite a lot of institutions. And so they think they're doing something because they've got a gender-based violence program or they've talked about gender-based violence. And, and I think they don't necessarily see the bigger picture that they might have got had they done more thorough gender analysis and, and engaged with you know, broader methodologies of understandings of gender in the process as well. And I think we have a what will be a final question from Zoe. If you want to unmute yourself, Zoe. Ah, oh, you're sorry, your mic is broken. Okay, it's a long one. Here we go. So, would there be a risk in trying to implement? Hang on, it's moving. Sorry. <laughs> would there be a risk in trying to implement gender recognition from the top down? How do you think this could be implemented in local areas, i.e., local health systems and health professionals? when it's not as easy to consider every context as unique in how they culturally consider gender? Yeah, so I mean, one suggestion that, that we actually um, put forward, we, we actually um, published a policy brief yesterday about how you could mainstream gender into the international health regulations. And one suggestion of that is recognizing exactly that, um, exactly that context which isn't WHO saying this is what you need to do. Uh, and this is how you know, a, a, a gender sensitive program looks like. It's requiring government at point of an outbreak being declared a public health emergency uh, to do a risk assessment, right? And to, to identify what the potential gender risks are in their context. And then you know, what steps are they gonna take to do it? So it's not telling them how to do it, I don't think. I think it's about getting them to think about, get, getting local context, different countries, different governments, to think about what are going to be the issues in their location and requiring that risk assessment, for example, to be submitted to the World Health Organization so that they're held to account for actually doing something and in, in even having that. Yeah, so I agree. I think, you know, it's about the policy level and it's about the structure. So it's about when we're putting together the JEE and when we're putting together the core capacity, the evaluations of core capacity criteria. Is there some question in there around gender risk assessments, gender audit, you know, um, then it is at that point, of course, and that's with everything right, then you've got variation then in terms of how states interpret and understand their obligation. We have that with women, peace and security agenda where the recommendation is national action plans. And we've got lots of variations in how countries appreciate the national action plans, which is now where we're seeing the creation of local action plans, because sometimes communities don't agree with the national action plan, so they're creating their own local action plan. So I think it's the same thing here. You know, it's it's about setting up the idea of, a, of, of an expectation of a conversation, and then there can be then that engagement at the community or the national level. But I would also add to that, that at the IHI emergency committee that is drafted specifically for each crisis, I think there is scope within those emergency committees, particularly if we're thinking about the location perhaps of the outbreak originally, to be thinking about how can voices be included in that conversation when assessing risk and when assessing advice. And that's again where we start to hit the rubber a bit here because you know, uh, it's the same issue that we have in Women, Peace and Security, where sometimes the voices who you should be including in the room, particularly in the gender space, may not necessarily be states. It might be civil society actors. It may be those who don't have that formal representation. So, you know, the solution in the, in the UN and Security Council very recently has been the creation of informal expert groups. that are that, and, and that was held for COVID-19, where, you know, Women, Peace and Security expert informal group came together in April and presented to members of the council about what they were observing in terms of the effect of COVID-19 in those areas that are under mission observation in the council. And I think that's the potential that perhaps could be thought about in the area of that COVID-19 and working group that Dr. Tedros has talked about, you know, creating a potential scope or environment for civil society actors in particular to be able to participate and to contribute at some, at some point in the process, I think, would be really important, but that's that's going to be risky. Um, so at this point, yeah, I think would it be great to have at least just reference to some form of gender analysis, gender advisor, gender audit in the system. Thank you. And that was pretty much running to time. So thank you both again for 
taking the time out of, I know everybody's got very busy schedules at the moment, but especially you two being on so many calls all the time. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. It's been very interesting, but also to everybody else that's taken the time to get up very early or stay up very late to join us from all across the world um, and for making the discussion really interesting with all of the great questions that you've you've brought to it. So thank you and great to see everybody as well. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, everyone. It's really, yeah, it's lovely to see you all. And, and thank you for giving us your time, your precious time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care.